now if you would, let me introduce you to my world record leg trap. Hey folks, do me a favor, practice CPR, catch, photo and release. The future of vision is truly in your hands. The summer sun never sets upon the Alaskan pike of the Unoko, in the heart of breathtaking Alaska. Evenings will be shared reliving the battles of Monster Pike. The midnight sun trophy pike hunt is on aboard the 67-foot luxury houseboat, and you're in command. If you're not, you should be. Contact the Midnight Sun Trophy Pike Adventures by calling 800-440-7453 or email them at mstpa50 at gmail.com. Hi everyone, Bob Nasekomer here for Grant Rods. You know, musky fishing's a tough deal, and the job's not done till she's in the bag. Well, how do you do that? It's pretty simple. You need big dog rods from Grant Rods. For your next rod, call them at 847-577-0848. Building custom rods since 1983. Hi everyone and welcome to the night show. Hey, you know, I've been around this industry for a long, long time and you guys are amazing. You're just absolutely amazing. We went over 3,000 again last week. That is so gratifying to know there's that many people out there who are interested in what we're doing, want to pick up on the knowledge that we can, uh, that we can extend here on our show and uh, take it for, for whatever it's worth. Take it to the water with you for that matter. And uh, that is so comforting, it really is. You know, I've been doing speaking engagements all over the United States. Fact is, pretty much all over North America. I spoke at the campus of Notre Dame, Anoka College. I spoke at the campus of Concordia, Chicago, Indianapolis, Green Bay, Milwaukee, Minneapolis, Duluth, St. Louis, Des Moines, Kansas City, the Quad Cities, Rockford, Madison, St. Cloud, St. Paul, Sartell, Kenora and Ottawa, Canada, Rochester and Fargo, North Dakota are just some of the cities that I've spoken in. And I've done fundraisers all over the Muskie region as well for Muskies Incorporated and other inspired sportsmen's groups. And there's one thing that I've come to learn talking to these people. It's they really want information. And here's another thing. They don't always hear what you're saying. Sometimes people get caught up when they're conversing with other friends and they're not listening, they're not paying attention. And you can't redo those presentations. It's pretty much what it is. When it's over, it's over. That said, about 15, 18 years ago, I had a college professor come to me after I got done with one of my seminars, a big setting in Minneapolis, probably oh, a thousand people sitting in the room. And he come up to me and he says, Bob, I got to tell you something. You are a natural teacher because you understand your subject matter totally. But here's something that's going to just absolutely drive you nuts as you go forward. And I said, what's that? He says, you're going to have to be redundant. You're going to have to keep telling people the message. Not necessarily again and again and again in the same phrase, but you're going to have to continue to send the message. And furthermore, he says, your audiences are going to change. As you go from city to city, from year to year, your audiences are going to change. You're going to have new people come into the game. You're going to have a tendency to want to speak, and I say this kind of politely, above their threshold, if you will. You will think that everybody that was there last year reattends this year, so therefore you don't want to go back and talk about what you talked about a little bit last year, knowing that the people who are there to hear new information want to go to the next level. And he was point blank when he said, you need to be sure that you bring your audiences up with you. And that is a very, very, very important thing. He said, it's not going to be something that's going to be easy to do. It's going to take you a little bit of time to understand how to do it. And you're going to seem like you're redundant, but trust me when I say you're not. You've got great skill sets. You have an absolute interest in a sport that few people have the understanding you do. So just take what I'm saying as a grain of salt. Just use it where you want to use it. And that was years and years ago. And I'll be honest with you, when that kind of input comes, comes forward, folks, you can't do anything but take it to heart because that's what it's all about. 
That being said, I want to take just a second here and I want to invite all of our friends who are out there um, that are involved in the crankbait world. Now, this is getting off subject a little bit, but if you're in the crankbait world, please get a hold of me, bob.m at fishandstickstv.com, and let's get you in to a show we have coming up. We want to talk about crankbaits. If it's got a lip on it, we want to know about it. If it dives beneath the surface and has an action and considered a crankbait, you want to know about it. And what we want from you folks is your opportunity to tell your story on your lure. How does it work? Why does it work? Who needs it? Where is it used? You know, a lot of the lures that we have in the musky world, folks, are very regional. They don't cover the entire musky gamut. So that being said, it's kind of a neat deal when you get an opportunity to talk to people who are really in the game and really aware of what's going on. What I'm going to do tonight, folks, is it's a little different. I told you when we started doing these shows that we're going to keep them very, very different. They're not going to be the same from every week to week. That's not what this is about. We want to make sure that people who are in the know know more and people who don't know will know as much as those that do. So my question is today, why are you here? Well, if you're at all honest with yourself, I would have to say you're here for one reason. You want to learn more about the fish. You want to learn more about how you can catch the fish. And success is a big thing. It really is. And I'm here to tell you that in our world right now, changes are coming in a big way. Social media, folks, is the future. This is how we're going to disseminate this information, be it on YouTube at Simply Fishing TV or over at Fishing Sticks on YouTube, either one of them. Over on our YouTube channel, folks, we've had 1.4 million views, 22,997,324 minutes of viewing. Folks, that's 383,289 hours. That's how much time you folks are devoting to what we're doing. And I, again, my hat's off to you folks because that's what makes us keep doing this. That's what keeps us on the ball creating new material and trying to keep you abreast of what's going on. Now, for those of you who don't know, I have a multi-species background. And we're going to be doing a lot as we go forward with other fish. We have been focusing on muskies because that's where our core group is. And we have a lot of musky anglers out there that uh, participate in what we're doing. So if you would, let's just, uh, let's just kick this thing off and start with a couple of questions. If you only had one of these items to choose, and let's say that, that the most important one is the, what we're looking for. Are we looking for structure? Are we looking for the type of boat that you would use? There's a lot of variables in the boat world. We all know that. How about rod and reels, length, action, brand? Are those the most important things? Lines, of course that's important. You've got a pole on the creature on the other end. And the right line choice, well, it's important. It's a very big important. Lure selection. We've been talking about lures for the last couple of weeks. We've talked about spinner baits. We've talked about jerk baits. We're going to be talking about topwater crank baits and other things as we go forward. And yes, they're important. And the lake. Of course, everybody wants to fish a top 10 lake. Who wouldn't? How about the closest lake to you? Is that important? How about the water clarity? Is that important? Is it stained? Is it dark? Is it muddy? All of these are important. But let's look at the last subject on that page, science. Folks, I'm here to tell you that science is by far the most important attribute you're going to have. Because if you understand the science, you're going to be able to repeat your successes. Only 10% of a lake, folks, holds fish. 10%. And that is a critical number. And when you talk about 10% holds 90%, well, that's a huge, huge deal. We've got 10% of the lake holds 90% of the fish. And I don't care what species we're talking about. In our case, we're going to be focusing on the muskie. But the bottom line is only 10% holds it. So if you're a water, water usage person out there, let's say, for instance, you do enjoy some water skiing or some uh, water biking, uh, uh, maybe even some, you know, some, some boarding on the lake and what have you, and you still like to fish, remember, 
that the friends you have out there that are fishing, they're limited to 10% of that lake. And that's where they're going to get the fish they're going to catch. Now, that's not to say that every fish in those zones is even catchable. What we're talking about is the epilimium. That's the upper portion of the lake. That's what we're going to focus on. For our musky fishing, that's where our oxygen purification, our saturation is the best. That's where our water temperature is generally the best. And that's the part of the column that will give us the biggest advantage for uh, success for an active fish. Associative processes are something that we're going to apply to the musky fishing as we go here tonight. And I want you to understand what that means. Because as we go forward, it is absolutely imperative that we understand one of the biggest things there is. And I've mentioned this word in the past. And to be honest with you, somebody might even know it. It's called anthropomorphic. This is attributing human form or other characteristics to anything other than a human being. We're going to break that down so you understand it. But tonight we're going to think in relative terms. How do they relate? Warm-blooded as opposed to cold-blooded. There are certain things that you can take to the water that apply to humans, but when you can start to coincide the values of, the, of what you perceive as in, in terms of what the fish is actually enduring, you're going to be so far ahead of the game. It's unbelievable. How to apply abstract thought? Critical. Dr. Bill Engber is one of these people who, he's a, he's a surgeon, so consequently he has a lot of knowledge of the anatomical part of the human being. But his brain thinks in these abstract terms. And when he and I have fished in the past, he says, you know what makes you such a good angler? And I, well, a number of things. He goes, no, I'll tell you what, one of the biggest things that makes you a good angler, you perceive everything that's going on around you. The structure, the movement, the forage basin, you perceive all of that. And then you build that into an abstract thought before you ever enter an area. You build it in to an application, if you will, just like a computer application. And when you start to break down the structures you're fishing, you really apply what you know. It is basically having the ability to apply abstract concepts to new surroundings and situations. The more you start to apply this mentality, the quicker you're going to learn how to fish the lake. Now, we've said earlier in the show that we're going to be doing something a little different. We're going to be putting together a group going to Witch Bay uh, next August. And I guarantee you that we're going to be able to, to elevate people's successes by simply, simply demonstrating what we're talking about right here on site while we're doing it. Important tangible relative aspects that we have to deal with, that's applying conditions and environment to the target species. Now again, tonight, just tonight, we're going to focus on muskies. Temperature is number one in relative in terms of success. Now what does that mean to you? Yeah, well, any species you try to fish has a comfort zone. The Inn Fisherman broke this phenomenon probably 40 years ago, or at least 35 years ago, when they started to talk about temperature zones and comfort zones. And I'm not here to tell you that they were totally right or totally wrong, but I'm here to tell you that they were pioneers in this. One of the most important things to remember is how and when do you choose your best opportunity? I'm going to tell you it is not the moonrise or the moon set. The impact or the window of opportunity of this cycle is simply too short, folks. You can't fish by a moonrise and moon set. Now, if you've got other factors going on and you've chosen the right structure you want to fish and you get up on there and you happen to be in that period, wow, take advantage of it. It certainly might have an effect. It's just not a predictable time period that you can go to something and expect in one or two casts because you got about five minutes. That's it. That's the effect of that cycle. I would much rather fish majors and minors and have a window of 45 minutes to an hour, hour, and 20 minutes. Understanding the relative water temps and trends and how they impact will dictate your lure choices and define specific locations of interest. 
You know something, the trend is something that's probably as important, if not more important, than the actual temperature you've got. Now we're going to discuss these temperature ranges as we go on here tonight. We're going to break it down so you understand exactly where the comfort zone of this fish is, how it moves through the column, when and why. But trends are important. Let's say, for instance, you're sitting there, uh, you're on XYZ Lake, and you get there, you pull up to the shoreline, you put your boat in the water, you do all of the above. You have no history on what went on in that system. Yeah, you might have been watching the weather reports, but they're not going to cover where you're talking about fishing. If you're fishing 50 miles away, the weather you're talking about isn't even relative. So that being said, how do you get a handle on the trends that have been going on? Hey, you ever put gas in your boat? You ever tie your boat up at the dock? You ever have a dock boy come to you and say, Mr. or Ma'am, can I help you tie your boat off? That's where your information source starts, right there because nobody on that shore has more information regarding the trends that have been taking place than that individual. And here's another thing. Even if you're kind of bashful in yourself and you don't want to ask the question, look how they're dressed. If, if you see the dock boy out there and it's mid-July or early August and he's running around or she's running around with a jacket on, chances are pretty good you're on the back side of a cold front. You might even be in a cold front. So learning how to anticipate some of this just by visual aspects can be very important in minimizing the amount of effort that you're going to have to put forward to find what you're looking for. Physiology, folks, this is the study of the mechanical the study of the mechanical, physical, and biomechanical functions of living organisms. And folks, what we're talking about tonight is not the need for speed, it's the need to feed. And the need to feed is what's going to dictate how you choose your structure, when in the day part you choose your structure, and in some cases, the lure you use on that structure. It's all going to be based on the physiology of the fish, and we're going to break that down even a little bit further as we go forward, because it is totally, totally important. Let's break down periods. Now we're going to break down these periods based on the elements. We're going to do this in a manner that you can digest it. Now the beauty of what we're doing tonight is we're not going to infiltrate this thing tonight with a bunch of fish video. We want you to be able to take this video when we're done tonight and we want you to be able to actually record it, save it, and be able to take it with you when you're on your next trip or maybe your next trip next year because all of it's going to apply. And here's something else for you. Regardless of the fish species you're talking about, all of these fundamentals still apply. All you need to do is take a few minutes and understand the comfort zone of your target fish and it will still apply. Regardless of the seasonal conditions, when water temps are below 70, your dawn, your early morning, is going to have about 25% proficiency. Your midday, it's only going to be about 10%. Remember what we said, prime sunny periods. Your pre-dusk, about 15%, and your dusk, about 50 What are the reasons? Well, during the dawn, your water temps are generally cooler. So anytime you've cooled off that water temperature below the 70 degree mark, you're below the comfort zone of the fish, you've slowed the metabolism down in the fish. Reason two, in the absence of cloud cover can retard the fish's activity, but as the sun lingers, you enter the peak heat of the day, aha, and then on to dusk. So you start to see a little bit of change going on there. Reason three, Pre-dusk sunny conditions, well, they can promote movement into the feeding areas. Anytime you have fish moving in a column for any reason, it's using up energy. If it's using up energy, to some degree, regardless of the water temperature itself, it will motivate a little bit of a physiological need because you're eating up the metabolism. You're eating up the food, the energy that's stored up in the fish. Here's reason four. By dusk, the physiology is engaged and they are positioned. They are key. So be prepared to be on your spot 
or on your spots, if you will. And if you're really good at what you're doing, you're going to find areas where you have multiple good locations in close proximity. So you can take advantage of these windows in short order. That's kind of the way we win the game, to be perfectly honest with you. If we look at sunny periods based on the elements and our temperatures are above 75, we start to see some changes. We see our pre-dawn, 45% expectancy. Our midday drops off, 5%. Our pre-dusk, 10%. In other words, midday, folks, is tough. In our dusk, we start picking up 40% again. Now, we're talking about above 75. Remember, when the fish hits 76, 77 degrees, they start to shut down. So we're right there at the top of their scale. Chances are pretty good during the middle of the day, your water temperatures might even accelerate above that. So your pre-dawn periods, 1 a.m. through daybreak, expose the fish to preferred comfort zone water temps due to the nighttime cooling trends. You actually cool off that system a little bit and the fish actually becomes more active. Your midday bite periods are slightly depressed and unpredictable. This is your research period. We've talked about this in previous shows. This is when it's bright, sunny, and you, you, frankly, you can get bit, but it's not your highest opportunity. So therefore, you go out and learn your structures. And your pre-dusk water temps, well, they're still a, uh, uh, too warm to fish, and the fish are in transition. If the fish have dropped down in the column, let's just say, for instance, that you pull up on your greatest structure, you look down at your surf temp, you've got 75, 77 degrees, and you're sitting there going, man, where'd they all go? Where'd they all go? Well, some of these fish simply drop down in the column. They may drop down 8 foot, 10 foot, 12 foot, whatever the case may be, and they'll find their comfort zone, but that puts them out of your target range. When you go in there at dusk, well, again, they're physiologically engaged and they're positioned. So when you're in this period, you're going to be taking high advantage of that of that late evening. Here's something else I want to say too before we move along. Folks, we got muskies in, I don't know, 38, 40 states now and of course all through Canada from from basically the western rim of uh of Manitoba all the way east. Um but when water temperatures get above 76, 77 degrees and I'm talking about solid water temps, Folks, it might be a good opportunity to leave them be. And I'm really talking about in the southern reservoirs when the water temps get up in that 80 range. Uh, you don't even have to go very far south, quite frankly. You can go over to Wisconsin. You can fish the Madison chains or over in Illinois and get on the Fox Lake chains. Um, all of those systems have a tendency to escalate above the 80 degree mark. And when that happens, it's in your, fit, your best interest and in the fish's best interest to take a breather. Get off the water, go find something else to do, uh, or I don't even know if the night bite's a good preferred deal because that water temperature might not drop back far enough if it's 80 degrees. There's so much going on with oxygen level, pH levels and everything in those high temperatures and it stresses the fish. Um, some of the fish won't even respond to presentations because they're so stressed. And, and if you see that situation, you know, put it back on the trailer and move on. Prime cloudy periods, folks, based on the elements, almost regardless of seasonal conditions, with the water temps are above 75 degrees. And clouds now, we're talking about periods and clouds. Your pre-dawn, 5%. Midday, 20%. Let's see what happens here in the afternoon. Your pre-dusk, 35. Your dusk is going to give you a 40% opportunity of success. The cloud cover changes everything. However, these can be mentally tough times because the angler anticipates much more success than he or she might actually realize. Anglers should be aware. Close to the boat contact is going to be, well, I'm just going to say it's the norm under these situations. Fish will appear at the end of a cast without any notice under these situations. You are harder to see and therefore more difficult for you to identify. Clothing is a key factor. A lot of people like to wear bright clothing in the boat with you. Uh, cloudy days, not the day to do it. It's just simply not the day to do it. No, no day is to be perfectly candid with you, but not on a cloudy day. 
Again, these fish are going to crawl up very close to the boat. You go over that fish, start to make a big figure eight. Even if you've got a nine foot rod, you've got that body mass hanging over the side of the boat, it's goodbye because those big girls simply aren't going to let you do it. And I, I, rain gear, um, cloudy conditions, rain gear is pretty much kind of the, the mainstay. You're going to be wearing it. Um, Again, I avoid the yellows, the oranges and stuff. I, I like to stay with the grays, the greens. I like to keep it as cool down in the color uh, spectrum as I possibly can. I want the advantage. I don't want the fish to have the advantage. Remember, you might only have one or two passes at a good fish in an entire week. So why would something like clothing, a mischoice of clothing, uh, be the reason you don't have an opportunity to succeed? It shouldn't be. Metabolism. Here we go. The rate of which the body burns calories or fat is known as the metabolic rate. This occurs when you do various things such as physical movement. And in this case, we'll stay focused on water temps. Metabolic rate can vary and will be affected by genetics, accelerated activities, age, environmental elements beyond water temps. Now, what does that all mean? That means we're going to learn a lot about the metabolic rate of a fish as we move on here. Feeding frequency is based on the water temp without any questions about it. Here we go with metabolism. The feeding periods between 51 and 67 degrees. Now I chose 51 to 67 degrees for a reason. Between 74 and 77 degrees. Um, anybody out there tell me? Anybody out there know? Well, we didn't until we put 15 years of study on this subject matter. 15 years logging every fish, the water temperature, the transition periods come in and out, the trends as we'll call them. And as a result of doing that, we got a huge understanding of how the fish responds, when she responds, and which ones respond. Um, if I don't get too far off subject here tonight, I want to talk a little bit about about the variables of how they respond and how you read them. Feeding frequency is based on water temp. There's no doubt about it. In 37 to 50 degrees, folks, you can expect an opportunity every 40 to 60 hours. Folks, what that says to you is you have one opportunity in every two to three days. Now, we're talking about a low percentage fish to start with. And as you can see in those cool temps, that fish really falls off. 51 to 67 degrees. You can expect something about every 30 to 38, 33, yeah, 30 to 38 hours. And again, what's one and a half to two days. In 68 to 70 degrees, about every 20 to 30 hours. In other words, an opportunity every day or day and a half. In 70 to 72 degree range, every 12 to 20 hours, that's one opportunity, one solid opportunity per day. 73 to 75, every 10 to 12 hours, that's two opportunities a day. Folks, this is a bell curve with a hard break on the end of it, very hard. When you get to 76 to 77 degrees, take a look at the numbers, every eight to 10 hours. Now what that's telling you, is you have three opportunities in a given day. That means three real opportunities. So if you combine what you're doing, your structures you're choosing with the majors and minors, with the right lure choices and stuff during summer peak, summer peak, and now probably I'm gonna go so far as to say that this, this every three hours or three opportunities a day is gonna be under prime conditions. It's gonna be under clouds. It's not necessarily gonna be under bright sunny conditions because of the variables we talked about just a moment ago. But the truth of the matter is you pull that classic day and it's Katie bar the door. Now here's something else too. You're not gonna find one or two fish. You're gonna find a number of fish. When these fish go, they seem to go as a society and they seem to ramp up. You'll start to understand, this is what I was talking about a moment ago, you'll start to see fish activity. Now this activity is going to give you an indicator of what's going on. Let's say you get out there and you get on the water and you got 73 degrees, 72, 73, you're, you're harboring right on that opportunity of one, maybe two a day. 
So you get out there and the first fish you got come up, she's low and slow on you. She doesn't want to go. She comes in and she falls off. No aggressiveness whatsoever. So of course you mark that fish in the back of your mind and if you're smart enough, you log the temperature of the area that you're in right there. You put it in your log book and you move on. As you move on through the day, you're also, because you're checking the fish, every time you do, you're noting your water temperature, paying close attention to what's going on, you see a trend. Water temperature is starting to rise. You go back on that first big fish you saw. You've left her alone until conditions are better. You're at the end of the day or close to the end of the day. You know you've had at least one opportunity, maybe one and a half opportunities in that day. You slide up on there, you make your cast. Now, now she's not two foot down four foot back. She's on parallel. She's on plane with the lure that you're playing with and she's two feet behind you and she's got her gills pumping. You know you watch these fish, you watch the you, you watch the front of the fish come in and you can see the mouth open and close and you see this membrane that's inside their mouth and it'll envelope and it'll depress and it'll fill up and it'll depress. Well what that's doing folks is they're tasting. They're tasting what's going on, and we're going to get into why that's important here in a few moments. But when you see this happening, that means that fish is engageable. That fish can be caught. How, how and what you do from that point on is whether or not you're going to get the fish. So the truth of the matter is, is knowing when and where to do this is absolute perfect. 47 degrees and rising, let's get some temperatures in here in the relative life cycle of the fish. I bet you not too many people out there know what the average home range is on a muskie. Um, I can tell you, nope, you're wrong. Yep, you're close. Yeah, you're close. What if I told you that the average home range on a muskie is 8 square miles? That's ice into ice out. So consequently, if you can imagine that for a second, eight square miles, imagine where that fish has to go, where it summers, where it, where it winters. You start to learn how these fish transition through the, through the column itself. One of these days, I'm going to do a seminar on, on how to pick out the absolute prime spots on a lake. And this is so dangerous because if people were really to understand it how the way we understand it, going to be a lot of fish out there with sore lips, a lot of them. I told Jim Gracka, he and I were talking on the phone one night, and I told Jim Gracka, I says, Jim, I will divulge for you when we're at Witch Bay next year, I'll divulge for you the secrets on how we find these fish. And you will come away light years ahead of where you've ever thought about chasing muskies. And again, you know, this the same mentality, same rule sets apply to other species. You just have to take the species and break them down based on their instinctual habits, their, their, their preferences, and go from there. All right, back to it. 47 degrees and rising. This is the spawning cycle, folks. Most of the time, we don't have an opportunity in the region we're in uh, to fish these fish in this water temp. We just don't do it. Uh, the muskies experience the first of two compression periods because the changes relating to their environment and they will uh, occur very quickly during this time of the year. I'm going to let you folks uh, read this and analyze the rest of it. I'll paraphrase these because they're, some of them are quite long to be honest with you. You can sit back and take it word for word and, and understand what's going on. I will tell you this, in recent history, in the last three or four years, I have seen some very, very disturbing videos. Very disturbing. And some of these talents that are doing this out there should know better. Uh, they certainly have a strong understanding of the species, but I'm afraid they don't have enough respect for it. Folks, what I'm talking about is some of these areas where we can fish muskies, you can fish muskies early in the season, these incoming cricks, these small feeder cricks and rivers, a, a muskie will always go up current, always. No matter what you do, the fish is going to go up current. It's a natural phenomenon of the fish. That said, they will work their way up into these cricks in the spring to spawn in areas that have this type of, uh, this type of situation. Leave the fish alone. If you're at all respectful of this fish, do not go down there and fish it. Leave it alone. Wait till that spawning cycle is totally done. 
Wait till those fish are out of there. Each one of those females that are in there are going to drop somewhere in the neighborhood of a quarter of a million eggs. Folks, when you pull a fish up out of the water in the spring and she's spewing out eggs, you've destroyed that spawning cycle. Totally. So if that fish had an opportunity to actually lay her eggs, actually drop her eggs, and had the males that were needed to come by and and fertilize her eggs, one half of one percent of those fish are likely to make it in the wild. Why in the world would you be disturbing them? So just for whatever it's worth. Uh, early season, uh, it may seem like a good fun thing to do, but leave these fish alone early in the year. They've got something to do. Mother Nature has put them on course to spawn and recruit the next society of muskies for you. It's the best time to basically leave them alone. Again, we can't fish them. Where we're fishing up here in Minnesota and uh, up into Canada, we can't fish this period. It's never going to happen. Um, if you're fishing muskies during this period in the Canadian waters or in Minnesota, you are definitely in violation of laws. 57 degrees is post-spawn. This is the transition period. Uh, this, at this water temp, the muskies will still be shallow, but in most cases, not far from their spawning locations. Now, again, look at the words, post-spawn. Post-spawn means they're done. That the delivery of those eggs to the system is over, and these fish are starting to get ready to make that first move out into the basin, whether it's back out the crick arms or whether you're on a, you know, got a big spawning wee bed. Uh, you know, can you imagine just for a second the amount of spawning that's going on in Green Bay? Oh, my Lord. The amount of fish that are over there. We had a gentleman on our show earlier this season that was fishing smallmouth. He was not targeting muskies, not at all. And he caught a 60-inch muskie during the bass, you know, fishing bass, pre-fishing for a bass tournament. And that's this very period we're talking about, this 57 degrees, the post-spawn transition period. That's when these fish are done with their spawning, they're started to recover, and they've moved out, or they're on their way out to what we call the next transition phase. Uh, again, um, take a few minutes and read this entire page. Um, it's... Quite frankly, it's very, very important. Um, there's so much going on. Uh, not all the lakes have vegetation. Uh, some of the lakes that do have vegetation, you can expect the fish to head there. Some of the lakes that are strictly boulder lakes and rock lakes and stuff, you can expect those fish to go out to the primary, first primary structures, and they'll start to house up there for a little while. Um, but, but just be prepared. They're transitioning out of that area where they have spawned. And again, they're moving. So once the fish is moving, guess what it's doing? It's using up, it's using up the uh, caloric value it's taken. And they don't take a lot on when they're spawning. Trust me, they don't. The females don't. Uh, the males, yeah, they'll eat. No problem. Fact is, that's going to be your first encounter. Um, generally speaking, when you come out of these systems like this, the males are going to recover way, way faster than the females will. And if you're in an area where you can fish in this water temperature, uh, Wisconsin being a case, Illinois being a case, I'm sure Kentucky, Ohio, um, a lot of these places where you have uh, more expanded seasons than we have here in Minnesota, um, you're going to have an opportunity. But your males are going to be your first target fish that are going to be coming out of there. 67 degrees, folks. This is where the home, uh, home is where the heart is. And by 67 degrees, you should expect the muskies to be established in their summer ranges. And uh, saying home is where the heart is, well, this is especially true for the muskies. Although fish use a great deal of structure elements, they tend to use areas that suit their biological needs. Muskies often revisit several structures within these areas, often several times a day, depending on the day-to-day -day weather patterns and the forage availability. Others remain homebodies and will travel very little. Remember, this will be relative to the size of the water you're fishing, and it'll also be relative to the, to the ecosystem that's involved in the lake you're fishing. All of this has to be adjusted for where you're fishing. Now, when I said the, some of them will travel very little, <laughs> can you say female? Yeah, yeah, 
you can't. You can say female because the females are the ones that travel the least during this period. In that 67 degrees, when they first lock up on those home structures, that female has a tendency to just be lackadaisical. She's going to eat. She's just not going to eat a lot, and she's not going to move a lot to do it. Uh, the male society that's with her, they're going to do most of that foraging on that structure. They're going to be the ones you see first, and um, it's pretty much what it is. 77 degrees, folks. We're peaking it out. This is it. Summer peak, and it's definitely by the pinnacle in the water temperature for the season. Some years in the shield, not like last year, for instance, the waters never obtain this surface temperature. However, at 77 degrees, muskies will feed more frequently than at any other time of the year. We broke that down for you earlier in these tables, possibly as often as every eight hours. Combine a stretch of stable weather during this period, and you can expect multiple daily catches and numerous follows, likely. Uh, you pick the right water, and you're fortunate enough to experience this, and suffice it to say, fishing can be as good as it gets. There's no doubt about it. But let me say this. Things can change, and if you have a cold front, come in when that water temperature is at summer peak, it's like you threw these fish into an ice container. They simply won't respond. When you have a severe cold front, one of these summer cold fronts come through, you have to alter what you're doing. Change up what you're doing. Don't be fishing your summer patterns. Don't be fishing those fast baits. Slow things down. Go to that walking uh, top water bait instead of the prop bait in that cold front situation. Go to your big, big blades instead of your small blades and, and utilize the thump out of it for the attractiveness and slow that speed down. Uh, yeah, again, again, we throw in the exception out there. The little guys are going to be the idiots in the field, if you will. They're going to be like five-year-olds and seven-year-olds that'll go out and play in a snowstorm when us adults won't even think about it. That's what these young muskies are. Under 40 inches, that's what they're going to do. But the big giants that we're chasing, they beat to very specific elemental drums, and this is just one of them. Here's another thing. Um, if you get hit with those super big cold fronts during that summer peak, during that 77 degree peaking period, be prepared. These fish will fall back to inside turns and use hard vertical breaks. And I'm talking about a two or a three day span where these fish simply aren't, they're just not comfortable. Everything about their world is turned upside down. Um, I've had that experience. I really have. And if you're fortunate enough to be on location when that element has happened. You get there, the dock boy's in a parka in August, and you're wondering what's going on, and the next day you find out it's going to be 90 degrees out, you've hit the gold mine. Because that day, from that day on, that first day of warming trend for the next two or three days, these fish are going to cycle up, and you're going to have an absolute ball. No ifs, ands, and buts about that whatsoever. In the fall, folks, 67 degrees are going to transition back the other direction. Around the backside of 67 degrees is when the transition generally begins. The fish are now likely to be found on the vertical sections of structure where they can easily access deep water and it's generally available to, him, to them with little effort. That's the whole key. They start to hang on to whatever value they've got in their systems in the fall. Um, you start to see less fish. Obviously, if you go back to the charts that we gave you early on in here, you'll find out your bite windows are incredibly lengthened. Um, you're not going to have nearly the opportunity, and that's because the fish aren't using the same structure. And here's another thing, too. If you're fishing your favorite lake, and you're used to fishing your summer peak patterns, and you're used to fishing those long tapering weed lines and or points, um, get off of them. Get off of them when that water temperature drops below 67 degrees. Get off of them. You're going to be focusing more on isolated structures, i.e. sunken islands, preferably some with vegetation on it if you can find them, and the fast breaks on the points. Now, not every point is tapered all the way out. Some of them are hard breaking on one side and will actually give you a steeper edge. These fish will use it. They don't move linear in the, uh, in the water column during this time of the year. They are very, very, very susceptible to vertical movements. 
Moving right along, 57 degrees, well, it's the benchmark water temperature of 57 degrees signifies the early fall and coincides with the turnover period. Now, if you've ever been fishing late in the fall, when you see that 57 degree water temp, you'll also smell 57 and below, below, not necessarily 57, but below 57, you'll start to smell kind of a swampy smell to the system. Even if it's a giant lake, like Lake of the Woods, you're going to find out that, that smell is going to start to come up. If you get this aroma in calm days and stuff, then you know you're actually starting to experience turnover itself. However, we're a little ahead of turnover here. Um, the muskies have begun to travel uh, from their summer home ranges. Uh, this marks a period when much of the available vegetation is dying or has died. Uh, fish again will set up in transition areas, sharp vertical points, shorelines, walls will become prime candidates. This is the time uh, multi ford species begin to uh, stage off break lines. Um, although casting these areas can be effective, uh, it becomes a lot more productive if you learn how to pull baits and pull baits correctly. Um, the fish will primarily be at a mid-depth level, 8 to 15 feet, as at least we found it. Um, and on days uh, following turnover, well, they can, uh, they can be just about any place they want. And I'll explain that why when we get to the actual turnover period. I was fishing with Dan Notke on Lake of the Woods years and years and years ago and we were actually trying to target a phenomenon, a turnover phenomenon. Here's my reasoning for it and I'm probably getting ahead of myself but we're here so let's talk about it. Um, not too many people f head to the system to go casting for muskies during a turnover period. Uh, it's a critical mass, if you will. The bottom literally comes to the top of the lake. It homogenizes, and that's where you get this aroma we were talking about. It's because all of that bottom mass is coming up to where it's exposed to you. Now, that said, with it come the acids and all the inconvenience of the f to the fish that's involved in the turnover. So fish have a tendency to basically shut down. It's about probably a 10-day period, just give or take. It, it, nothing's carved in granite here. It's about a 10-day period from the turnover until you're going to start to see things happening again. And you'll know that you're in that period when the water clarity goes gin clear. You'll know you're past turnover. Now, let's back up a little bit. How about before turnover? How about when it's happening? That's right. Unbelievable what you can do if you understand what the fish are doing during this period. It can happen on any and every lake. It does not matter where you are. Any and every lake will be exactly the same. When that lake starts to turn over, what happens is the bottom of the lake starts to come up. The water on top gets heavier. It's more solidified. It's, 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 it's denser. And that water will drop into the column, forcing the bottom from down below to homogenize. It'll come into the column. As this is happening, it starves the lower layers of oxygen. So that means the fish are going to always be above that threshold of that bottom turning over. So if you find a ledge or humps or anything like that that you can reach with your crankbaits, uh, reach with slow rolling spinnerbaits, um, uh, the big A-team stuff, uh, there's any number of lures you can do it. On your graph, if you're watching what you're doing with today's te te technology, you'll see where the thermocline is as it's coming up. When that thermocline gets to about 16, 18 feet and it's coming up on you, start to choose structures that peak out at about 12 to 14 feet. These fish will lock in on those structures until they can no longer withstand it and then they'll keep coming up in the column until it's all over and that's when the fish becomes hard to catch. Dan Notke and I were fishing on Lake of the Woods and we were trying to hit this phenomenon and I cannot recall how many fish we caught. I'd have to go back and look at the video. Um, but I got a hunch, I remember, I think it was like 18 or 20 muskies we caught in a short window. I'm talking 45 minutes to an hour total. And we had fish from 42 to 52 and a half inches. And the boat never moved more than about 120, 130 yards down a shoreline fishing a ledge because we read this phenomenon 
to a T. And it was one of the most incredible things I've ever done. You're not going to go choose it to fish it. It's simply not going to work. But if you're there and that happens to you, be aware you can target some of those structures that are above the threshold of influence for the turnover and still catch fish. 47 degrees, fall trophy hunting. This is when it happens. When the water temps plunge to 47 degrees, well, the muskies are well entrenched into their fall season. Fish are well established in the transition areas, again, use, utilizing vertical structures. They are now in the process of energy conservation, and this is important to remember. Some of the larger females may even experience being sta be beginning stages of egg production. Muskies are feeding and focusing on forage with high fat content like suckers, whitefish, cisco, and even small trout. So if you're in areas that give you that kind of access, man, it's crazy, crazy. Uh, I fished with a young man over in uh, Wisconsin. We did some soft plastic fishing during this period. And oh my goodness, did we have some fun over there. And he taught me an awful lot about pulling these big swim baits late in the season. Fact is, this is what they're doing on Mille Lacs, for those of you who aren't aware. Um, this is the time and what they're doing on Mille Lacs to catch these giant fish. You're going to see a 60-pound fish come out of Mille Lacs Lake. It's inevitable. It's going to happen. Uh, fish will most often be at their peak weight, uh, trolling areas. Trolling these areas is a primary consideration. I'm not a troller, but those who are proficient at it will find this to be very, very good. Again, the fish may still respond to uh, during warming trends to shallow water structures. And if you hit an Indian summer, let's just say, for instance, you're on your favorite lake, it's, you expect to hit this cold period, and you hit that calm, sunny conditions. I mean, two or three days, real Indian summer, Man, get on those structures because those fish still enjoy those structures and they'll come right up on top of them, taking advantage of that warming trend. And you don't want to miss out on that option. I know I've been there. I've done it. Um, you can talk to uh, Kyle about it and Kyle will tell you, uh, Kyle Brixen will tell you point blank, we kind of blew it. So this is the troller's time of the year. Uh, this the, the fish, are, again, are going to be way, way down in count. You're going to be, you know, one or two fish a day uh, in trolling effort, um, maybe three if you're really lucky. Um, so that's what's happening in the fall. It just, it's, uh, the, it's the time to hunt big fish. Um, and later on in this presentation, I'm going to give you some more insight on why the fall brings on a different set of situations. 37 degrees, folks, we're breaking out the park as, um, I'm sorry, but for me, I'm gone. Uh, I'm headed to Costa Rica for something else or Brazil for peacocks or something. Uh, the fish are now usually found in deep water. They're established in wintering zones. Uh, this is a time, however, I will tell you this, uh, years past, I haven't done it for a long time. Um, if you're a jig fisherman, if you're a jig and soft plastics fisherman, especially with jig and lizard combinations, learn to fish the hard breaking inside turns that still have exposure to the sunlight, i.e. in other words, northwest facing or northeast facing, I'm sorry. Uh, they're taking on that sunlight directly. These fish again are moving vertical in the column. They're not moving linearly on the, on the points at all. And if you find them, you'll find them huddled up. You can catch, I think we caught 17 muskies in one afternoon over on Bone Lake fishing lizards. Um, and it's really quite, it's, it's, just, it's exhilarating to say the least. Um, deep trolling and, and casting are also very effective. Uh, again, we go back to the way we were fishing them with the soft plastics. Again, slow is the, is the key. For the soft plastics, you want to get down there and probe those depths and move it around. Those that are trolling right now, uh, Wisconsin waters, for instance, are probably row trolling. Um, I've got friends of mine, and I'm not a live bait fisherman at all. Uh, but again, I'm going to touch on why live bait becomes, becomes a key issue during this time of the year. But I'm not a live bait fisherman, but those who friends of mine who are live bait fishermen will take full advantage of this, and they will pull their... Their offerings along slowly uh, with trolling motors during this time of the year with relatively deep set suckers. Um, and uh, I, I've never done it, to be perfectly honest with you. I've never done it. I've been offered the opportunity, uh, but I'm just, uh, I'm, just, uh, I'm just an artificial fisherman. But 
Trolling guys, figure deep, figure hard, vertical breaks. It is what it is. I'm generally gone by this time of the year. If you're still fishing, then you are more hardcore than I am. Uh, and I wish you the very best. All right, choosing a lake, folks. How do you choose a lake? What do you need to know to choose a lake? There are elements that influence everyone and everything. Forage. Forage is capital. It's just if, ands, or buts about it. But let's just use Lake of the Woods for a second because it's a big body of water. The forage will change from the top of the lake to the bottom of the lake. So forage is important, but you need to know the forage that's in your system or in the part of the system you're fishing because that is going to dictate where your muskie is going to be, where that predator is going to be 99% of the time. Um, there are places, uh, I can think of a few um, off the top of my head, uh, that give uh, the Manitou, for instance. Super, super clear water. Uh, the forage is, a lot of it is trout, and you will have a lot of those fish on that system, for instance, that will be out there suspended. Uh, let's just use Forest Lake for a minute. Uh, in Minnesota, just to give you an example, Forest Lake's got heavy populations of crappie in it. And during the midsummer, you guys know crappies suspend. There's a huge society of muskies that suspend under those crappies or around those crappies, just like they would with Cisco and Tulabi on lakes that have those. Uh, Great Lakes would be another example. Uh, look at Green Bay. Uh, I guarantee you that these big muskies over in Green Bay are chowing down on those trout. They would rather take a trout before a smallmouth any day of the week. Absolutely, any day of the week. These fish know, instinctively know, that oily, uh, high-protein base is a better fit for their metabolism and their survival. Lake classifications, uh, of course, we're talking, in this case, we're talking eutrophic, mesiotropic, uh, and, and oligotrophic systems. Uh, to give you an idea what those are, oligotrophic is going to be your infertile, uh, your, your very sterile systems, um, very clear water, um, generally cooler waters. Uh, they're going to throw at you a different set of circumstances than, than a late class mesotropic will. A uh, late class mesotropic lake is going to have a Celsius disk of about probably 12, 14 feet. Uh, which gives you an idea how deep the light's getting, um, which will give you an idea what your vegetation levels are going to be, depending on the type of vegetation. It'll also set up, to some degree, your lure choices. Um, so that's kind of interesting and important in of itself. Eutropic, I don't know anybody that's really fishing muskies in, in, in real eutropic systems. So uh, that's very fertile. Uh, the closest I would come to that... Um, and from my previous experiences, would be probably Sabascong Bay um, and east end of Sabascong Bay. Later in the season, that is a very, very fertile basin. And when you get to that class, that's what you're talking about is fertility. Um, what's the depth? What's the depth of your lake? Is it important? Um, in some places it is. And again, it goes back to the forage that you're fishing or the forage that the fish are feeding on. Um, if they require depth to have enough suitable forage for them, then it is critical. If you don't have depth and you still have good forage basin in it, uh, let's just say, for instance, the lake is only 15, 20 feet deep, doesn't, doesn't stall out during the winter, doesn't kill out during the winter, and you have you know perch populations, panfish populations and stuff, these could be good choices. These are, these are the type of choices that are going to be more the metro lakes, the older metro lakes that we talk about all the time. Uh, they might have a 30, 40 foot maximum, but most of that lake is going to be shallow. Here's a great example, uh, just speaking off the top of my head, Mille Lacs. The average depth of Mille Lacs Lake is incredibly shallow. I'm guessing now, because I haven't seen a number in a long time, the average depth is like 7 feet or 10 feet. Uh, incredibly shallow. And that is a 33,000 acre lake, I think, or maybe it's a 133,000 acre lake. It's 32 miles, basically, any way you look, from what I've been told. You know, Mille Lacs Lake, I've never fished muskies on Mille Lacs Lake. One of these days, somebody's going to call me up and say, let's go fish muskies on Mille Lacs Lake, and I just might have to take you up on it. Hey, structural elements, weeds, muck, rock, rock reefs, islands, island clusters, current, 
all of this, all of this becomes a big deal. How about clarity? And we're talking about particulates in terms of clarity. Our water temps, yes, it's all part of the structural elements and they really affect the fish. If I'm looking for areas where I'm gonna have the best opportunity, I'm looking for areas that'll hold societies of fish. So I'm looking for weed lines that give me good populations of forage and predator. In the shield systems, I'm looking for areas that give me condensed rock structures, um, something that I can bing, 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 bang off of six, eight, ten places in short order during prime periods and get an opportunity at one or two big fish. Um, that's what I'm looking for. Um, I'm not a real big fan of the muck bottoms and stuff, but muck can play a, can play a part. Uh, if you're aware of the rusty craze at all, let's just go up to Vermilion for a second. Let's just talk about Vermilion for just a second. Uh, I was talking to another television host a few years ago, and he actually called me when I was on the water, and I happened to be fishing, shooting a show on Vermilion at the time he called me. And I broke down, uh, told my cameraman, take a breather, and uh, we were chatting for a second. And I was telling him what was going on, and he could not believe what I was defining. I could pull up on a structure, as many have, and you could see 8, 10, 12 fish just sitting up there. And if you were paying close attention, you could also see what they were eating on. These muskies have learned to eat on these rusty crays. Remember, a crayfish is about 18% salinity, okay? So that that creature has a lot of value to the muskie. They don't have to go out and chase other fish or other other types of forage when they have the smorgasbord sitting right in front of them. And that's also why some of these fish that sit up on these reefs are really hard to catch um, because they're just plentiful, plentiful populations of, of rusty crays and, and these muskies uh, enjoy them. Fact is I've got video footage, underwater video footage of Lake of the Woods uh, where we have uh, had underwater cameras down and you watch the floor of the lake, it's like a carpet of crayfish moving. And these are, again, the same areas that we're catching some of our giant fish. Uh, fishing pressure, man, it influences everybody. It influences the people, it influences the fish. Um, there's no question about it. So if you're living in a metro lake, uh, let's say you're out of Chicago or you're around the Madison area, the Twin Cities area, I don't care. You can be up at Boulder Junction, I could care less. If you're in places where you have a lot of population on the lake, on the surface of the lake, on, on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, folks, go out there because that's your opportunity as well. But be prepared to go back there, out there on a Wednesday or a Thursday because your percentage of success is going to be up quite a bit. Now, of course, I'm paying attention to other details at that same time, but that's when the fish have rested out. Um, they're probably less traumatized by everything that's going on and you get a better opportunity of them. That's kind of key. Minnetonka in Minnesota, great example. Absolutely great example. Um, barometric pressure, man, it is one of the absolute most important things you can, you can fish by. Um, if you understand how the bladder in a fish works, the air bladder is the buoyancy bladder in the fish. Uh, the musky, the northern pike, uh, the walleye all have a single bladder. It's cylindrical in shape and as the barometer changes, so will the pressure in their bladder and that will dictate where they are in the water column. So the higher that pressure is, the higher that daytime pressure is, or nighttime pressure for that matter, the fish goes down in the column to alleviate the stress. When those low pressure periods come in, again, the reverse takes place. The fish comes up in the column and you have a greater opportunity of seizing a big fish. That's quite frankly, pretty cool. Angler pressure, uh, it's, um, we just talked about that briefly in the fishing pressure, it's one and the same. Lake size, um, I had a guy tell me one time that, that fishing big lakes um, will produce bigger fish. Well, I got news for you. Uh, they can, and they can because the lake is large enough that the fish eludes mankind. So they have an opportunity to grow. But in today's world where we have 54, 55 inch minimums, um, and in some cases total release, I don't think the size of the lake is, is nearly as important as it was back in the 80s and 90s when we were searching up all these big fish. Um, 
if the fish has got the ability to have forage cover and the the physical makeup in other words the ecosystem necessary to grow to size including genetics then lake size is really unimportant uh i grew up fishing a lake up in wisconsin big mckenzie and uh, Wisconsin and yeah I'm saying Wisconsin because I'm about to tell you I have caught 54 and 55 inch muskies in McKenzie in Wisconsin so that being said it's only a little 12 or 1400 acre lake uh, huge depth got great forage populations got incredible weed lines it has all of the physical makeup to be a big fish producer and um, it's not unlike any others. There's a lot of those lakes out there. Um, and furthermore, it didn't have a lot of fish repression on it, which I think was great. Uh, preferred water temps, yeah, it influences everything. I think we've touched on that enough tonight. Uh, it's important that you pay attention to what we've taught you up to this point in terms of water temp, because it will be the rules you live and die by. Predator senses, sight, sound, smell, and taste, folks. This is, all, again, another thing that you need to be aware of. Hey, I want you to do me a favor. Uh, right now, I just want you to take two seconds, uh, if you would, uh, just take two seconds, and put your hands out in front of you, just like I'm doing right now. Put your hands right out in front of you, okay? You see that distance that you got right there? That's the area in which you have to be in front of the fish. That is what we call the strike zone. So when you are out there, think of that fish, think of that engaging part of the fish to be about 32 to 36 inches from the point of the nose of the fish to where your lure is. And that is where the zone is that you have to, you have to engage that fish. That's when you have the best opportunity. Sound, of course, I'm not going to harp on this too much tonight. It is something. You need to be quiet. The lateral line is a very sensitive organ in the muskie. The longer the fish, just think of it as a satellite dish. The bigger the satellite dish, the better reception of the signal. Same holds true with the muskie. That body is long. That lateral line is long. That is very sensitive. There's microscopic hairs. Basically, if you can think of it in terms of microscopic hairs inside of pores down the lateral line of that fish. And every time something moves in the water column, these fish sense it. Now, they can sense minnows moving in the water, for crying out loud. So when you're banging stuff around in the boat, mm -hmm, it's going to be a big issue. Do scents work? Well, I don't know, folks. I've got to be honest with you. Um, fish detect them by, you know, by molecular structure, uh, and it must be water-soluble. Here's my problem with scents in general when it comes to musky fishing. Um, we have such a low-frequency fish in terms of your opportunity that you would have to be spraying or applying the scent basically every cast in order to be able to measure whether or not it has real value. Um, I just don't know. Um, I would just prefer to have you keep your hands relatively clean and uh, and go from there. I will tell you this. <laughs> this is kind of funny. I will tell you this. How many guys out there catch northern pike when you're musky fishing? Yeah? A uh, couple? A couple? Yeah? Well, here's what you need to do. You got your favorite bucktail. You got this northern pike that comes up on you and eats it. Take that slime off that northern pike. That slime stays on that bait better than any artificial attractant I've ever put on a lure. I can smell that slime on the bait a long time after I apply it. And if you're trying to mask anything or trying to entice a fish based on the scent, that is one thing you might want to try to do. Amino acids. There's 22 standard amino acids that are the structural uh, units, if you will, uh, the, the, the mononomers uh, that make up proteins. Um, these 22 standard amino acids um, either are used to synthesize proteins uh, or other uh, uh, biomolecules or oxidized urea uh, for, in carbon dioxide as a source of energy. Um, why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this because as the water temperature gets colder, amino acids become very critical. Amino acids are what the fish senses when it comes up to a sucker late in the fall. Okay, um, That is the, one of the triggering devices. In a couple of slides further on in here, I'm going to give you an idea why this is important. But I'll go so far as to tell you this. 
I have a personal belief, and I've been around enough ecologists, um, and we've discussed this, and they also believe about the same thing. The muskie, like all freshwater fish, are cold-blooded. And that being said, um, their, their digestive system, if you will, is triggered by intaking natural forage, i.e. amino-based acid, amino -based acid um, um, let's just use the word, suckers, okay? So here you go. Um, you fish fish on an artificial bait, they hit the lure, they feel the hook, yes, whether it's harmful to them or not is yet to be determined, but we release the fish as quickly as possible and nothing physiologically has been engaged in the fish. It might have a little stress level from the exposure to our presence, but the bottom line is you haven't physiologically engaged the fish. When you're talking about sucker fishing, okay, a fish comes in, eats the sucker, and as soon as it does, it trips, that brain trips the digestive tract of that fish. It's part of the physiology of that creature. So fishing with sucker minnows can have a downside. Um, and it's that you're going to release a fish that has, has already activated the acids in its stomach for incoming forage. And it could be, well, it could have a detriment to the fish. Um, that's sort of up for debate, but I just wanted to let you know what's out there. And it's kind of important if you're a real sound person. All right, what do we need to know about sound, folks? S-O-U-N-D. It's critical. It is literally what we're all trying to achieve with some of our lures. Physical attributes of sound, well, basically, sound will travel at 4,800 feet per second at 70 degree water. Now, we're using the 70 degree water, folks, to kind of stay in that, in that prime range, if you will, the comfort zone of the fish. The speed of sound in the water depends on the temperature. It can travel 1,480 to 1,530 meters per second. That's up to 4,896 feet. It's about four times faster than the speed of sound through air. So when you're banging stuff around in your boat, be aware, they know it. Physical attributes of sound, well, the sound itself, the speed of sound through any medium depends on the temperature and the physical properties of the medium. In freshwater, sound travels about 1,497 milliseconds at 25 degrees Celsius. The speed is greater than in air, in dry air, 20 degrees Celsius, 68 degree Fahrenheit. The speed is about 343 nanoseconds. Because of the much greater tendency of water molecules to return to their original position than in the case of air molecules, which have a smaller uh, inner, inner uh, molecule uh, forces, then the sound itself not only generates faster, but has a bigger footprint in the process. Uh, if we take a look at low frequencies, low frequencies travel further than high frequencies, sort of a misleading deal. Uh, even though it's correct, lower frequencies tend to pass around and through objects more effectively than do high frequencies. High frequencies are often absorbed or deflected by objects in the environment. So if you're, if you're sitting there fishing in a big weed bed and you're pulling that big thumping blade back, chances are pretty good your low frequencies are going to be much better. Um, those low frequency topwater baits like the Miorca, which is like a 9.9 Merc out there running, uh, will again work very well. Uh, they'll pull these fish up through these obstacles uh, with greater ease. Um, low frequencies tend to be a better attractor uh, if distance or attitude is required. Uh, higher frequencies tend to be a better triggering mechanism. Uh, because of the high-pitched noise, uh, it has a taller wave. So if you, if you think of it in this terms, it can be easily interrupted and cannot therefore travel as far uh, as a lower sound. Uh, initial energy um, can also affect the values of sound wave lengths and the distance traveled. So if you're running uh, a bait that you need to trigger a, a reactionary strike on, um, that, that high frequency bait is going to scream through the water, if you will. Uh, it's going to be a, a nice broadcast footprint. 
and it's going to attract fish that are sitting up say maybe 15 or 20 feet away from where you're casting that you're not even seeing and those fish will sense that and they'll draw them in. Now keeping in mind that we're talking about relatively high water temps at this point uh, so consequently the fish is already engaged and you have a better opportunity at it but sound is important when you're picking lures low frequency versus high frequency when do you pick it um, it's pretty much cut and dried uh, at least in my boat it is perplexing boom box if you will or fire alarm uh, is the blade too big is the blade too small uh, is it a low frequency high frequency rattle or no rattle clear water stained water prop versus walking uh, all of these things have to be dealt with and they have to be dealt with in a relatively short window you don't have a lot of time so knowing ahead of time how to choose your lures coming into a zone will make all the difference in terms of how successful you are in those small little windows that we have in terms of success. Remember, musky fishing can be countless hours of sheer boredom broken by only a few seconds of pandemonium. Choosing these right lures can make that happen. And I've done it again and again and again. It's really critical. All right, um, the environment, folks. Uh, it's a big piece of the puzzle. It's the biggest. Colder conditions tend to require more senses. I told you we would talk about this as we got to the end. Um, when you have 73, 74, 75, 76 degrees, you might only have to trip one sense of the fish, maybe two, to get that fish to trigger. Let's do this really quickly. Let's say that you're down there in the bottom of the spectrum in the 57 degree range where you still have an opportunity to cast at these fish. You might need to trip three of their senses. And here's why the musky fishermen have a tendency to really use uh, live bait in the fall. It has very little to do with tradition. It has very little to do with the fact they may or may not have enough lures that are suitable. It's the fact that when you get down into that ultra cold water, that 37 to 42 degree range, these fish are literally desiring four or five senses to be tripped in order to be engaged. And one of those is the sense of smell. And when you have a live sucker in the water, guess what? You've got that covered. Uh, not often do you have that opportunity with artificial baits. So in the fall, yes, you can still catch fish on artificial baits. We do it, um, but you will have maybe even more success with the live bait. One of these days, I'm going to get off my high horse and fish with somebody who they actually understands how to quick set or quick strike muskies and maybe go out and try it. Um, haven't done it yet, I'll be honest with you. Every big muskie I've ever caught has been on artificial. Every big muskie I've ever caught has been on artificial being cast, not even trolled. So that said, I've got a little bit of learning to do myself. Memory. Do fish have memories? <laughs> yeah, yeah, they do. Well, what are the factors that can influence these, uh, these experiences, if you will, to the point of memory? Well, if you go back and look at some of the studies that have been done, Berkeley did a lot of studies, as did the University of Florida and others, uh, in terms of bass. Now, now, keep in mind a bass isn't a muskie, but let's just, let's just correlate the two for a second. The, the bass that were caught on soft plastics, and I'm, I'm talking about relatively small soft plastics, single hook applications, were less influenced and easier to be recaught. If you were catching fish on crankbaits, and again, this is this they've got a data to back this up. If you were catching fish on crankbaits or multi-hook lures, chances are pretty good it took longer for those fish to return uh, to respond to another presentation of sorts. And so, drawing just a correlation, yeah, there's a certain degree of memory that these fish have. I'm not saying we totally understand it, but I'm saying there are some lures that if you're fishing waters, and the reason I'm bringing this up, you're fishing small lakes, and you, you have limited access to a lot of lakes or big lakes, and you have to rely upon these smaller Wisconsin lakes, Minnesota lakes, and what have you that have muskies in it, you might want to choose lure presentations that less affect, if you will, the memory side of the fish. And that might mean really single hook applications, you know, a lot of, you know, a lot of jigging and lizard fishing and, <coughs> excuse me, things of that nature. Um, when you get up to the top and you start pulling blade baits and stuff, um, uh, 
uh, you're going to tend to wash out some of those fish. They're going to respond a few times and then be harder and harder and harder to catch. I think anybody that's ever gone on a lake uh, where the stocking process has been in place and you've had the opportunity to fish it through its cycle, you'll find out that the fish seem to be easy to catch, easy to catch, easy to catch. As they get larger, 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 more people encounter these fish, they become harder to catch. And it's not because they're changing much in their lifestyle, it's because the experiences they've had. Whether it's noise on the water that's provoked them to be more cautious, or whether it's been a hook in them that again has forced them to be even more cautious. So yes, there are things that these fish do encounter that I think they retain in some degree of memory. It certainly isn't like us trying to remember Webster's Dictionary. Not the same but their influences are there nonetheless. So just be aware of it, how you handle the fish, how long you have the fish out of the water. All of these things can influence the fish's memory, if you will. All right, again, I'm sorry I took up so much of your time tonight. I uh, hope we had something out here that you, uh, that you liked and uh, feel free to contact me going forward. Again, this is a dry, dry presentation tonight in terms of not seeing a lot of fish. But the bottom line is you don't have to see my fish anymore. Go out and find your own because we're gonna teach you how. Watch us over on um, my YouTube channel, Bob Masacomer, Simply Fishing, or on Fishing Sticks TV. You can watch both YouTube channels. Uh, would love to see you there. Remember to follow us here on Facebook uh, with Fishing Sticks TV. Uh, this is what it's all about for us. It's growing an audience. And if you would, again, you know, and I do this every night, every night that we have a show, I ask you to please share the information uh, if you would, put it up on your page, put it up on your friend's page. Uh, we are getting more and more of that. I've got about probably eight or nine people who have sent me the go-ahead, the okay, if you will, to post on their pages. And this is by all means helping us grow. And you can send me a quick email at bob.m at fishingstickstv.com. And if you would, just... Give me the, you know, the thumbs up and we'll start posting uh, when we put the show up in the second generation and get it on your page and you can help contribute to our growth. Our growth. With that being said, this is Bob Mesa Comer and I'm not getting out of here tonight without at least telling you folks a little bit about who makes our show possible because if we don't, we're not going to be on the water much longer. Um, there's so many things out there that that people don't understand and one of those that I want you to understand are the people who make it possible for us and that's Witch Bay Camps folks you can get a hold of Witch Bay Camps at 807-548-3076 call Steve or Gale that's 807-548-3076 and remember we're going to be up there next August so if you want to sit at the dinner table with us sit at the breakfast table with us share some fish stories on the dock maybe get some insight as to where uh, you should be headed for your fish that day I welcome you um, up there with us in August and we're going to have a good time the Midnight Sun, folks, we haven't talked nearly enough about the Midnight Sun. We haven't talked about the pike fishing that they offer up there. I'm trying to get these guys on the show with us. You want to catch some giant pike. I'm talking about musky stature pike. Wow, Midnight Sun, that's the place to do it. Trophy Pike Adventures in Alaska. Um, you can get a hold of them at 800-440-7543, and they will be more than happy to take care of your needs. Absolutely, without question. Uh, Grant Rods, I've, you've heard me talk about Grant Rods before. Um, I'm gonna tell you he's got more sticks in the stable than anybody I know. Uh, best custom made rods I've ever put my hands on. Jim Grant is definitely a provider uh, in terms of keeping us on the air and keeping us growing. He's a great promoter. Uh, and you can find him at the major sports shows this winter. Take a look at his brand. And I'm sure you'll be amazed when you put one in your hand. He can be reached at 847-577-0848. That's 847-577-0848. And again, Jim's a great, great guy. He will certainly take care of you. Cliff Bathmore's at the Basca Fishing Lodges, folks. I broke the world record up here on Lake Trout a couple of times. I broke a northern pike. 53-inch northern pike I've caught in this facility. Um, this is where fishing dreams really do come true. 
There's no question about it. And Cliff will get you out on that big bird of his, uh, get you over into some remote waters if you want. Uh, he's got some small outpost lakes that he likes to fish that the walleye are just, I think the walleye crawl in the boat with you. And there's giant northern pike. So stop up and uh, give Cliff and Stella a call. Uh, get up there and take a chance. Uh, have some fun for a fish of a lifetime. It's really interesting. They can be called at 877-922-0957. That's 877-922-0957. Again, really super good people. I have fished that lodge for many, many years. Never been disappointed, not once. And Century Lodge, there's no question about it. You want to go, you want to get on the water, you want to fish smallmouth, walleye, uh, muskies, um, they're all right there. Rich, Randy, Kay, um, all of them, just great people. Holly's up there for the summer, she's a sweetheart. Um, these people are genuinely nice and they run a beautiful camp. And I think in all honesty, they are, they're quite frankly, the, the kind of person you want to know if you're looking to spend money on your vacation. With that being said, folks, I'm Bob Mesa-Comer, and we have spent a lot of time with you tonight. We've run through a lot of information. We did it quickly. Uh, I put it out there in the printed form with you, stayed in the printed form with you so you could read it. Um, I was paraphrasing a lot of it tonight. Read through those the, the, the pages that we put together for you. That's information you can take to the bank and you can do a lot better than possibly what you're doing today. And I would be proud to say that I helped you. Hey, get some pictures to us, folks. Remember that. Get some video to us. Remember that. And you crankbait fishermen out there, again, I want to say, please, crankbait fishermen, do me one big favor. Get a hold of anybody out there, folks, that you know of that's a crankbait fisherman and let them know that we want to do a show on crankbaits. We want to do a show that really, really highlights that particular product because that's where we're headed next. We want to talk about lip baits, lipless baits, crank baits, things you can pull back to the boat, things that aren't necessarily in your arsenal right now. We want to talk to the manufacturers. We want to talk to the people who make it happen. That is really kind of like what it's all about for me, if you would. So that being said, hey, I'm Bob Mace Comer saying God bless. Thanks for allowing us into your room, to, into your living room tonight. Maybe you're watching us on your portable device. Remember, we hit over 3,000 people again last week. And uh, that being said, if you share with us, share our pages. And if you would, please send us your information so we can share on your page. We'll grow this thing even faster. Do me a favor. Go kick a little tail. This is Bob Mace Comer for Fish and Sticks. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye.